upsets, bad officiating and scoring, trend analysis, some things in boxing never change. Today's video is going to be about upsets and the whole nine that I just mentioned. Um, let's talk about the weekend recap. Uh, Breakus versus McCaskill. Now, most people I checked online with or that I spoke to who saw the full fight um, told me they thought Cecilia won. Some others thought a draw would have been acceptable. Um, I scored the fight for Breakus by a few points. When you take a look at the judging, uh, there was a card that read 95-95. Fair enough. However, when I heard scores of 97-94 and 97-93, having watched the entire fight, I figured this would be another title defense for Breakus. It wasn't to be as McCaskill is the new undisputed uh, women's champion or female boxing champion as they say for the scoring I'll give Karen Holderfield a pass she had the 95-95 uh, card but I'm unsure of what David Sutherland and Gerald Ritter saw. What I saw was McCaskill trying hard early on and having moments. But I thought defensively, Brekus made her miss based on her output, based on McCaskill's volume. Now, Brekus is 38 years old and she's not perfect. Jessica did land some solid shots, especially early. However, when you talk about the cleaner, more accurate shots and the efficiency with which rounds were fought, I thought the champion controlled. I, I thought she controlled it. McCaskill threw 500 punches and Cecilia 269. Actually, I think... Uh, McCaskill was 499, 500, 269, 270. If you want to round it off, whatever. But I believe it was 499 to 269 thrown. However, Cecilia landed 32% of her punches overall to only 17% for Jessica. And I thought that was a big piece of uh, how the fight was won. Now, many stories that you'll see online, I'm sure will say that Jessica outworked Cecilia. But you can't outwork her by being as inaccurate as she was. She was inaccurate. So, what it translates to is ineffective aggressiveness. When you look at the total punches landed, you see that it was an 85 to 84 advantage for the former champion, Breakus. That means what Jessica produced was ineffective aggressiveness. That's just based on the numbers, guys. She fought well, but she was wild for most of the fight, in my opinion. And from the middle rounds on, I thought Cecilia took control with her accurate counter punching. It just wasn't punches landed. It was make you miss and pop you. She's not a knockout person. But she buzzed um, McCaskill, uh, she buzzed her a couple of times, but I thought she took control with her accurate counter punching after making uh, Jessica miss. And however, it wasn't to be, and we have a new champion. Um, and it's a good story. I'll hit, speak on that in just a second. 
But this sets up well for boxing. Um, whenever someone is dominant or gets old or both, boxing looks for the better story to write. And this, I feel, happened here. Okay, hear me out. We, we talk about uh, Jessica's homelessness um, as, a, as a child. And we compound that with one of McCaskill's losses was to Katie Taylor. Now, Katie Taylor is the golden girl of boxing. She's who they want to market. And with that comes gift decisions like Taylor got against her soon who she'll be fighting very soon in a rematch. If Taylor wins the rematch, then that sets up another rematch between Taylor and McCaskill. It's, it's, it's just a better story. Do you... Um, she was homeless. She lost to her. Now she has all the belts. She's a much better fighter. Let's do it again. It just makes for a better story than a 38 year old champion who keeps on rolling and then if Taylor wins that fight with McCaskill if everything plays out as I stated so far which the powers that be in boxing want they want Taylor to win she will not only have five belts at welterweight the five that McCaskill currently owns um, but she'll also hold four other belts at lightweight. So you're talking about nine. <laughs> I mean, there's a boxer named Tori Nelson, T-O-R-I Nelson. And if you go to her Facebook page, if I can remember, I'll add the picture on this video. She's the only person I saw who actually, she had 10 belts at one time. No, I mean, all of them weren't world titles, so to speak, but and she had them all laid out in a, in a nice way with like with her in the middle of them. And that's the thing. You've seen people with two belts on each shoulder and then one wrapped across their chest or something like that. But to have nine, um, I, it, it would be nice to see <laughs> somebody take a picture like that to see if they can top what Tori did. Um, and that's Tori Nelson. I don't know if I said Tori Hunter or not, but Tori Nelson. She has since uh, retired from boxing, but she's got the itch. So who knows? Um, but it's, it's a better story. So in essence, it lines up nicely for boxing's golden girl, which is the path the powers that be want. Beat Pursun, fight McCaskill, beat McCaskill, and the world is yours. Uh, so in essence, um, as I said, it, it, it lines up nicely for her. If Taylor loses to Pursun, then McCaskill can push for a Breakus rematch or maybe a, a Callie Reese fight at Welter. Or if she wants to try to uh, melt Clarissa Shields down to Super Welter, she can. Um, even though I think Shields can fight two classes above that where she has in the past. So it'll be interesting where where um, McCaskill goes if Taylor loses to Pursun, which many believe she did the first time around. So it's, it's, it's very feasible. Um, if that happens, maybe uh, Jessica can get a showcase fight in the States. She's uh, an American. And then uh, shoot for a showdown later on in 2021 uh, For Cecilia Hey, that's the way boxing goes and that, that's kind of the attitude she she took it's like, okay Let's celebrate the champion which which I have no problem with everybody wants to talk about class and overly talk about class and overly talk about class Yes, it was classy, but I didn't like the way she answered the question. Um, I'm a person that if I ask you a yes or no question, don't like just answer the question. If I ask you five questions, the worst thing you can do is answer four. Like answer all of my questions. So when they asked her, did you think you won the fight? She didn't answer it. She's like, look, 
let's just celebrate such as not nah, <laughs> nah did you think you won the fight answer my question so I, I didn't like how she answered that piece of uh the post fight interview but I think with some days and with when she kind of when it sinks in or what have you she'll she'll interview the interview right now is uh certainly Jessica McCaskill that's what everybody's chasing but I hope hopefully people won't forget the accomplishments whether she retires or not that Breakus gave and they'll interview her and I think she'll open up a little bit more and and be more direct with some of her responses after she graciously uh, praises Jessica again um that's the way boxing goes though anything close and they'll take it from you especially with age ask Golovkin ask Hopkins um Cecilia chose to part ways with Jonathan Banks and she decided to go with Abel Sanchez it's funny because Gennady Golovkin dumped Sanchez in favor of Banks so we got a little uh carousel going on here and um what I didn't like I've, I've questioned Abel Sanchez in the past and, and don't get me wrong Abel's my guy that's my dude that's my man but she was in Big Bear training camp during the pandemic and then camp started and then it stopped and then it started and then it stopped and then it started all right that part I get about camp but her training the training part never stopped and it was in that big bear altitude also see in my opinion I think Abel Sanchez sometimes overworks his fighters and when they age I'm talking about and she did look sluggish early on in this fight and and look as I stated Abel's my guy but this wasn't a good idea especially for a 38 year old woman you don't want her to have a non-stop training whether camp um the actual training camp started stop started stop she kept training and at 38 and at in big bear i think you have to hit the brakes at some point um i remember shane mosley overdid it in camp um before fighting floyd mayweather jr if you remember <clears throat> Um, Shane Mosley was training to fight Andre Berto. I went to that press conference. I saw David Hay. It was at the, uh, oh man, it was at the Mandalay Bay. I saw Roberto Duran, David Hay. I'm thinking press conference to announce Berto and Mosley. I, I didn't. And it, uh, there was a fight. I can't remember who was fighting. But anyway. <clears throat> Um, he was training, so it, it was it was the press conference to announce Mosley versus Berto. And the thing is, Haiti, the situation in Haiti happened, and so Berto backed out to go home to Haiti to kind of be there for his family and for just uh, the people there. And so Mosley decided to defend his titles against Floyd Mayweather Jr. And Mosley never broke camp from what I hear and went on to keep training for a fight that was five months later. So he just kept it going instead of taking a break. Um, he just didn't look the same. Not to say the result would be any different, um, but it didn't look the same. Same with Golovkin. There were some fights where Golovkin was sick on fight night. They could blame it on the change of weather if they want. I, <laughs> there were some fights where there were some weigh-ins that I saw where Golovkin just looked drawn. He looked drawn out. And he's not a huge, he's not a big middleweight, especially back then. 
where it, it was a little easier for him to make weight. He just looked drawn. And I, I just didn't like Breakus to switch trainers at this at that at that point, but you never know in boxing what goes on behind the scenes, so um and it, it it may be less of a situation where it didn't work with Banks more than once Golovkin fired uh Sanchez, he had time on his hands because the, he just lost his blue chip guy and she worked in Big Bear before and she knew Sanchez and was impressed and said, well, since you can dedicate some time to me because G is out of the picture, let's do it. But you know, you don't know. You don't know. If I have a chance to talk to Banks, I'll, I'll ask him like what happened there. Trend analysis. I think the trend is here. There... Their first trend is there have been some terrible judging in boxing always, okay? But the trend is there have been some awful scores since top rank began airing fights, and it has continued. The main trend, however, is that you are going to see more upsets as long as there are no fans. The word is anxiety. I'll tell you why. There's a guy I knew who was a beast in the gyms. A beast in sparring. A beast. Just a beast in the gyms. But he didn't have a good record in the ring. And people say sparring partner mentality, but it's a little more than that. It has to do with performance anxiety. Now you see some NBA guys out there playing who usually don't do anything in big games, but since there are no crowds, no pressure, it's just like playing a pickup game to them now. Or, 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 or being in the gym, like the boxer I referenced. You see, when those lights go on, and the building is packed with fans, these same guys can't perform. But you put them in a gym, gym setting, or, or you take the fans away and put them in that basketball setting, and they become something they've never been. And this is what's translating to the ring. You see guys without the added pressure of the fans, and they don't have that tunnel vision they start doing things without that, those, those hot lights and crowded arenas when ordinarily they, they kind of choke in the moment. You're going to continue to see upsets as long as this uh, continues without the fans and so on and so forth. Mark my word. Um, that's, that's the main trend that you'll see. And so uh, you can ask a lot of people who like to bet on games because they're, uh, <laughs> they're a little short on the funds right now. And it's just because of what I referenced. Um, let's move on. On the undercard, Camden, New Jersey's Raymond Ford got some good work in and won a unanimous decision. Now, the goal for Ford in this fight was for him to sit down on his punches, but Ford didn't do it much. And he still cruised to a win, but he, um, so he needs to go back to the gym. He needs to work on it. And, and once again, performance anxiety comes in a different, a lot of different ways in the bedroom. <laughs> and as far as something you work for, work on in the gym when you get out there and try it, um, and, a, and an opponent is not, <clears throat> I'll say, um, he's not gonna make it easy for you. Sometimes you abandon it. So he's gonna develop, he's only six and oh. Uh, Gerald Ritter, who was the same judge who scored it 97-94 for McCaskill, was the only judge to score 59 points instead of 60 for Raymond. Now, this is the same 
Gerald Ritter, who didn't call a clear foul on Edges Kavaluskas. That's the green machine who recently fought Crawford. He didn't call a clear foul on the machine when he hit a guy when he was down to kind of end the fight and knockout. Not to say that <clears throat> the guy um, wasn't going to stay down anyway, but you can't do that. Ask Roy Jones. Um, same Gerald Ritter. How about the fight with Israel Madrimal versus Eric Walker? <clears throat> All right, we told you Walf Walker was tough as nails in the preview, and man, did he and Madrimal prove it or what? How about the referee? A guy named Gary Ritter. You think Gary Ritter is related to the aforementioned Gerald Ritter? Well, do you think Jermel is related to Jamal. <laughs> Gerald Ritter ruled that Walker got hit with a punch that would have knocked him out. He was right on that. But then he said Madrimal followed through with his shoulder to add to the knockdown, which he did, no matter what Sergio Mora says. The difference is the shoulder wasn't thrown on purpose, like, like as a foul. It was a balance thing. So he was kind of trying to keep his balance. And so it wasn't like when Bernard Hopkins scored a TKO over Felix Trinidad, when he kind of pushed Trinidad on purpose. Like he landed the right hand that hurt Trinidad and he pushed Trinidad to make sure, <laughs> make sure he went down. That could have been ruled a foul. And Felix could have been awarded a five-minute recovery period. So it was a bad night for the Ritters. And um, they need, we need to be critical and we need to keep an eye. All right. On ESPN, the Jackal, Carl Frampton, held serve in his fight against Darren Trainer. Now, we predicted Trainer would work him and he would last in the fight which he did. We also predicted Frampton would get only his second knockout in his last 10 fights, okay? And the fight played out as we thought. So the win for Frampton sets up a showdown later this year against Jamel Herring. Should Herring win? Or should I say, should Herring fight? <laughs> Hopefully he won't have to deal with, with his third, in my opinion, false positive test also in the co-feature Michael Conlon <sighs> scored a 10th round TKO over Sofian Takuch I've seen Conlon live a couple of times including when Conor McGregor walked him to the ring that was like um like a St. Patrick's Day fight. And as I've stated in at least six videos, I've never been impressed with him. And I'll keep looking for the magic everyone else sees. Uh, Colin's looking for something big, but in a change of pace, Michael stated he'd move down to junior featherweight or super bantamweight. And look for something big so Conlon he's he's already ranked third at junior featherweight by the WBO and he wants the winner of the upcoming title bout between um, the, the newly crowned champion Angelo Leo excuse me Angelo Leo and number one contender Stephen Fulton um, that's a good match whoever he faces Conlon and, and, and Conlon he'll have a chance to impress me against either guy in 2021. <clears throat> On Showtime, David Benavides. 
he let Romer, Alexis, and Gulo know who's boss en route to a 10-round stoppage. 10th-round stoppage, okay? And Gulo forgot to punch in at the time clock as Benavidez overwhelms him and landed everything. Uppercuts, hooks, the whole nine. And this was just what Benavidez needed. He went some rounds, got some work against a guy who wasn't just going to uh, lay down. And, and if you want to believe the box rec tape measure that these two guys are of equal height, well... In the co-feature, one of the worst decisions you'll see was Rolando Romero being incorrectly awarded a unanimous decision over Jackson Marinez. If this fight were in New Jersey under Larry Hazard, the judges would be suspended. And this fight might have been declared a no contest if, Herod, if Hazard could do that. Glenn Feldman is a guy we've mentioned in the past. Has the pandemic hurt his pockets? If so, maybe he took a little something under the table for his troubles. Okay, 116, 112. You must be joking. Frank Lombardi, 118, 110. You should have picked up a pink slip with your paycheck, Frank. Or, or maybe your paycheck should be held up pending an investigation. <clears throat> There's no way Connecticut Sports Commission should pay him. And then we have our guy, our favorite referee on this channel, Don Trella. Coming to your area, causing mass hysteria, Don Trella. Hopefully you people don't give him a pass like you did in the first Gennady Golovkin fight with Saul Alvarez. Adelaide Bird's card was so bad, people forgot Don Trella scoring it 113-113. No way. But subconsciously, Everyone focused on Bird and her card, and only Bird and her card, except here, where we focused on Trella. And, and listen, I like Trella. I talked to him for 20 minutes last time I was in Vegas. But let's look at a few uh, facts. Don Trella is the Vice President of Human Resources at the Mohegan Sun in Connecticut. That's where the fight was held. Mayweather Promotions is Romero's promoter and one of the lead promoters of the show. This isn't difficult math, folks. Will the Connecticut boxing wing of the commission suspend Trella? Well, let's see. If we look at the 2018 Connecticut Boxing Hall of Fame, we see Coco Kidd, Bill Gore, John Harris, Brian Clark, Angel Vasquez, and guess who? That's right, our guy, Don Trella. Coming to your area, causing mass hysteria, Don Trella. And I don't have to tell you where the event was held, do I? We'll catch you on the next one.